Assalamu alaikum and welcome to Islamic Finance 101. My name is Almin Cholan and I'm your instructor for this course. Today we are talking about Islamic perspective on wealth and money. So let's get into it. Bismillah. Often I get asked, what is wealth? Is money root of all evil? How do we imagine this topic? And sometimes I ask my student, tell me something that comes to your mind when you think about wealth and money. And people start often talking about all of the either on one side, negative things associated with money and how evil and how bad people are who have it and they probably came to money by doing some corruption and so on. Or people would say, oh, money is the fulfillment of my dream, a source of ease, um, I can do all of these great things and so on. It's interesting when we are looking at this situation, I often think that uh, the way we look at it is basically by observing what's happening around us. It defines our relationship with money, but also our experience and experience of people that we see in, in uh, possession of money. Because during the time of the Prophet wasallam, the companions would look at those who are rich as people who are excelling in good deeds because the way that they would uh, spend money to do good in their society. And we see so many examples of companions doing great deeds that really show that what the Prophet wasallam used to say that wealth in the hands of righteous is a blessing, basically. When you think about wealth, really... Wealth is like a trial, like a test. It really, as uh, some scholars say, magnifies what is in your heart. Now, what is in your heart? Well, think about wealth as a, something that has uh, levels. On each of these extreme, you would have either extreme wealth or extreme po poverty. Extreme poverty is very dangerous. It uh, puts person in a very difficult circumstances where it is sometimes pushing people to deny God to, to as, as some of the scholars would describe in their book, it's almost like the darkness that comes that invites people to disbelief. And it can be a great source of temptation for some people. Not for everybody, but it is definitely a great trial for a lot of people. So extreme poverty or poverty in general is not a desirable state. That is why the Prophet ﷺ said that upper hand is the better because you don't want to be waiting for somebody to give you. So that state of weakness is not desirable in Islam. At the same time, you see on extreme and extreme wealth where person is giving up entire life, time, uh, every other aspect of life just chasing that, that wealth for the sake of the wealth. And that wealth is not used for any benefit of society or good. It's just a measure in itself. It's all about quantitative growth. So what is the right way to think about, profit, uh, uh, about this particular topic? Well, often I think about wealth as something uh, that you sacrifice your time for. So think about the skill. The wealth on the lower end, when you don't have much of it, more wealth gives you much more utility. You can do now much more. You feel free. You can do things. Opens the possibilities. Now, the wealth accumulation comes to the certain point where every additional dollar doesn't extract as much utility as, as you think. And so what you want to do is perhaps think about wealth in a sense that, number one, it's a trial for me. When I have it, I have to... Uh, make sure that I do the right thing with it. I don't allow wealth to possess me. I possess the wealth. I keep it in my hand, not in my heart. And remember, we are here on this earth to be tested because in the paradise we were given tests where uh, we had all of the wealth and everything that we wanted, but we failed the test that we were promised this little tiny corner of the paradise and we were told that this is also what we need to have in order to be content, to be happy. Shaitan came as a sincere advisor and said, this is the part you really need. Then you will be like angels. You, don't, you will have this insurance policy that you don't need to worry. And this is the part of the human nature. You see, if in the paradise we wanted to have it 100%, what about on this earth, which is nothing compared to paradise? And the Prophet ﷺ compared the situation that 
he said the son of Adam wished this wealth. You know, if he had the wealth of mountain of Uhud, he wants another one and another one. What will satisfy him is the dust of his grave. When he realized, in essence, what is the wealth for? So the wealth is really to be used, to be mastered over, to understand that you want to link your heart not to the material and to the wealth for the happiness, for the full life, but you want to link yourself to the rope of Allah and to understand that He is the provider. To Him you link your fears, dreams, hopes, duas, not to the wealth. The wealth, you want to earn, earn it, you want to have it, but not sacrifice the entire of your time because the life is all of these other things, your relationships, your health, time you spend reading, your spirituality, faith, all of these things. You want to balance all of this. The wealth there should serve you to serve God. You don't want to be egocentric. You want to be God-centric with your life. And as some of people say, the purpose of living is giving. And you get a great way and opportunity to master your heart when you are actually giving. I remember uh, one of the scholars uh, gave example when he was establishing zakat in his area. And the first time these business people who were paying zakat for the first time, they were coming and they were shaking. They couldn't separate themselves from the wealth. But after a few years, when they got used to give money, the next time they would come, they would put zakat on the table and they were happy to give it. They cured this something in the heart of us to attach ourselves to that wealth. So yes, wealth is very useful. In the hands of a righteous person is great. But we also don't want to go over glorify the wealth where it's all about new car you have and where you are going, where you are just obsessed about you. And so we want to have a balanced way, a righteous way, and always think about why do we need that wealth? What are we trying to do? And this is why for some people, wealth can be indeed trial, can take them away. So you have to know yourself, how wealth is affecting you. You need to structure your life around that with the right people, right environment. You need to take care of the heart. But at the same time, you need to make sure that you don't go to any of extreme. And the worst of extreme is not necessarily where you are on the gliding scale of how, or between these two extremes, but how much of your time and life and energy you, uh, you spend to get to that stage. There is no passive wealth. There is no wealth that is just by itself generated. These are just fake stories. People who are selling get, quick, uh, get uh, rich quick ways of living life. There is a balanced way. There is a way that you want to do good. You are on the mission. You want to impact this world. Do something that is righteous, that is useful. And at the end of the day, cure yourself, purify your soul. So when you go to the paradise, you are not the same person who is connected to that wealth as if that wealth is the source of the happiness and joy and everything else. So what can be legitimate wealth from Islamic perspective, in general, wealth or mal is anything that you consider from Sharia perspective is legal. We could say uh, has Sharia value. So, for instance, would bottle of wine or alcohol be considered wealth or in a contract subject matter? It has a value on a bottle, like $200 value. But from us, that is only economic value. It has zero Sharia value. So for the Muslims, this is not wealth. Anything that doesn't have Sharia legal status or zero Sharia value cannot be wealth. We are not allowed to buy it, sell it, profit from it or anything else. To be wealth, something has to be usable and useful. And also, as I said, has material, economic value. You must be able to buy it, must be capable of owning. You need to be able to, to create inventory of it, to account for it. For example, let's say if we want to sell oxygen in this room, can we say, can I say, here is the oxygen, it's yours. Can you take it? Can you put it in the shelf? What, what can you do with it? Is that the wealth? Oxygen is useful, has the Sharia. Is Sharia doesn't say it's haram or anything. It's just there. But is it, is it just because it's intangible? You can't catch it? So if I were to sell you 
just something like that, which is very vague, which you can't grab, it wouldn't be exactly wealth or subject matter. Now, if I do capture this in a cylinder as it is used in a hospital and so on, then that oxygen could have some value. In a sense, is this something that is useful, usable, has real economic and Sharia value, and is legitimate? Now, this can be also physical item, some sort of usufruct, could be intellectual property, anything that people customarily agree it's wealth, it's specified and fulfilled these conditions, it's a valid subject matter uh, in the contract and our arrangements. Obviously, big part of the wealth and also in our uh, contract is what type of money or today what we call currency, what is the uh, money that we are using. It's a forming today major part of our wealth. And it is also a payment method in all of or most of our contracts because we are not really doing barter anymore. So if you go through the history, people have used all kinds of things for money. Here there is, a, I remember the story of this stone money of Yap, Yap known as Rai, where people would carve these uh, big stones from the mountains and they would transport them and they would put them in the streets of their village. And then everybody would be owner of some of these big, huge stones. And if you wanted to sell your house, they would say, now you own that stone and I own your house. Funny things one happened when they were transporting one of these stones and it sunk to the bottom of the ocean. And the people who were transporting were sad that they lost the stone. And then one of them must have been a banker. He had a great idea. He said, well, we lost the stone, to, uh, which is now at the bottom of the ocean, but we know it's there. So what we can do, we can still use it to buy and sell. We will just refer to it. You are now the owner of that uh, uh, stone and we will transfer it like that and we can still use it to buy and sell, which is a funny story. You know, sometimes when I think about today's money, at least in those days, they had that stone. And sometimes when you print the money, <laughs> you, you wish you had that stone linked to your money. But uh, in Islamic history, we also seen uh, uh, gold and silver. For example, very popular gold is uh, known as dinar and silver coins were known as dirham. So usually uh, that was very popular at the time. Uh, in, here in Australia, indigenous people would use sometimes shells in a prison. You might see people use cigarettes as the money or during the war. I remember in Bosnia, soldiers were paid in cigarettes. Everybody was paid in cigarettes. And um, yes, we don't believe as in cigarettes uh, in terms of they are very un uh, unhealthy. They cause diseases, shouldn't be done. But at that time, whether you believed in cigarettes or not, everybody was using them. I remember even one time in Bosnian war, soldiers approached my father who went to the market with me to, to, to buy some supplies and soldiers started shooting about our head just to get to those cigarettes. And we were guarding them with our life. He didn't want to give to them. So today we are using this money it used to be linked with gold, but you know, the wars, the pressures on that... Um, a commodity made it so that in last few decades, um, no one is really using any uh, gold uh, as, as, as anything. So it's just basically money is now being printed. It's governed by the rules that are in place. And that affect how much money we have in circulation, how much trust people have in it. And it doesn't have any of these intrinsic value that we used to associate with money. Nevertheless, we do use it these currencies, we do use it in society and they do perform functions that they perform. Now, there is an interesting saying by Hassan al-Basri about the money, and that goes to the function of the money that it performs in society. And he says that money is a, such a friend of yours which benefits you only when it leaves you. And this is such a beautiful way of capturing the money because the money is not designed for itself, which is why you can't sell it. Money is what Ghazali says, a judge of other commodities. It's there to judge what is what in society. And how does it perform that judgment? It has to go in circulation. You have to depart from the money. I want to buy the iPhone. I, I, I value it at $500 or we agree with offer and acceptance. 
this is what it is. And so money must leave you to benefit you. How the money benefits you? Not by staying with you. And that's why in Islam, hoarding of money is not good. Economic principle of Islam is that money should circulate in society, not just stay in the pockets of few. And so you do it by circulating it or through partnership and investments in the businesses. And so when you spend that money to get something, this is when money benefits you because you get things that you need to benefit you. So money is not meant for itself. So from that, we have several key functions of the money. Number one, to understand that money is really made to be a source of ease in transactions. So we don't have to do barter transactions anymore. It's therefore used as a medium of exchange. It is something that facilitates the trades. It is also used as a unit of account. In order to facilitate the trade, you need to know what is the worth of these commodities that you are buying. So it's a, it's a use for pricing goods or services. And to really be good at buying and selling, by the time you earn that money and you spend it or you pay it in future, you want that money to be trusted to keep the value over time, especially in deferred uh, sales. So money must be storable, portable, recognizable, and divisible, and it is based on the confidence and trust in its value. Today, when we look at how our money today performs this function, and usually people often in the comment section write, Everything is haram, only this money, that money, uh, this fiat money, haram, we can't do anything, we can't start doing anything until we get the right money. First off, money, to tell you the truth, money is the follower, is not the leader. When you are constructing economy, my advice for everybody is consider what you are producing in that economy. What is the subject matter that you are involving? Money is just the serving part. Money is just facilitating transactions. If you think of the first bigger picture, if on one side you have all the production in one hand, let's say you divide people in half, two halves, and the production is on one side and all of the money, gold and crypto is in the other part. After a few years, where is all the money going to be? With producers. So I often see people focusing when it comes to economy on what the money is. Yes, money is very important because it facilitates the transactions, but it's only facilitator serving the economy. It's not the ruler. What is economy? GDP, P, production. So think of yourself or your economy or your business in those terms. Number one, what is it that you are producing? Number two, when it comes to the function of money and how much trusted or good, ethical or unethical, and so on. Yes. Fiat money today has no that intrinsic value that allows government to easily print it, which leads to the risk of inflation and potential misuse. And this weakness in governance of supply of money and how it is then multiplied once it goes through the banking sector, through the interest, is why a lot of people at least would consider it to some degree unethical. Some countries more unethical as it is more volatile and abused than the other. But in a sense, there is a major weakness regarding the trust in those policies that are attached to this supply of money. And particularly when, uh, let's say, different types of money start going in certain weaker economy and we have effects like dollarization and instabilities and so on. So this is a big topic maybe for another discussion on economy and how to strategically think about it. But the gold that we often would like to see money linked to or referenced, we do value gold because it has certain properties which are intrinsically valuing it and makes it harder for the government to manipulate. Remember in the past, even um, in early Islamic history, gold and silver were becoming very expensive, which is why government would make uh, copper coins, other materials, and even consider a skin of a camel or some, some other forms uh, for smaller transactions to make life more easier. But largely today, we have abandoned these things. And, you know, quality of money, I'd say, often depends on the quality of the, and honesty of your government. 
lot of people then bring about cryptocurrencies. To be honest, I'm not a great believer in cryptocurrencies. They are also not used in um, daily transactions. Sure, you can transfer it and so on. But basically, the, let's be frank, the reason why people engage in this is not to buy and sell something that they really need. It's basically they are thinking that if the price of the Bitcoin or anything is today, $1 tomorrow will be 2 and I'm going to be hoarding it and holding it and so on. So, so as long as that cycle is there, uh, it's very expensive. There are some other issues with it. Uh, I, I do not think that this is a great or much better than fiat money. This privately made money that is actually linked with incentives that reward creation of the money. And that is why I, I prefer Ibn Taymiyyah's take that money should be something that is uh, financed by public. It shouldn't, you shouldn't make money from money, which is interest. But he also said to the Mamluk sultans, don't make creation of money for profit activities. And that creates very bad incentives for the government. And I think for the, to the, to the miners and speculators and, you know, those people who are into the crypto. Uh, creation of money became for profit activity. I think for us, if we want to have a sound money, it has to be something that is uh, financed by the people in a government that is trusted to preserve its value and have a policies to make it really trusted medium of exchange. But in any case, whatever that is, today your major uh, marker of wealth and uh, medium of exchange is whatever currencies that we are using. And I would say, it is what it is. That's what you have. I wish we have something better, but let's not fall into the mistake and say that rules of Islam don't apply to it. Rules of riba, rules of zakat equally apply to this money, whether we like it or whether we don't like it. And I think what we should be focusing on is what is it that we are using money for in our society? What benefits are we creating? And that is why when you look at the companions, uh, if you look at the uh, Sahih Bukhari, you know, uh, some of the first narration in the book of business transaction is talking about life in Medina, the companions who are busy in market trading, dealing in property. And even Imam Bukhari brings the hadith of Abdurrahman ibn Auf in the beginning, who is coming to Medina as a migrant, having nothing, people offering to give him charity. And he says, no, may Allah bless you in these things. Show me where is the market. Show me where is the business conducted. And he soon goes, he engages, he becomes very, very uh, wealthy, and he helps the society. He gets married and... This, this sort of entrepreneurial activity, this sort of leadership economically is what we need today, like what Yusuf salam did in his time. We need to see where we are as an economy, especially the Muslim-majority countries. What are we producing? What are we making? Can we feed ourselves? This is the real core of wealth. What can you do? This is how I define economy. I would say even forget about money. What can you do? Because if whatever you do, whatever you produce, Money will come to those people. Who are the biggest companies in the world? Those who solve the biggest problem, who produce, and money goes to them. Money is the follower. If you are the leader, money will follow you. Money is not going to be attracted just because you want it. So think of yourself as economy. What am I doing producing? What skills do I have? And this is going to become even more important for the future. You have global uh, breakdown in supply chains, end of globalizations. More and more economies are reshoring. They're bringing capacity back home. Strategically important that you don't have to rely on somebody else far away to produce basic things that you need to consume in your life. Or people are getting more into regionalization where at least we cooperate and build something in our region. But it's very strategic that the way we think about wealth or money or is capacity to do something. My wealth is what I can do. My economy is what can we solve problem and so on. And so task for this time that I want you to, to, to write in the comments is what do you think why the Prophet ﷺ said that wealth in the righteous hand is a blessing.
Can you give examples of how righteous believer would use wealth today in the right way that is productive and also generous? And what would you do with the wealth? Thank you very much. I'll see you in the ne- next episode. Assalamu alaikum. Do, 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 do.